Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And uh, my guest today is uh, Dr. Eligar Sadek, the co-founder and CEO of uh, uh, Astropolitics Institute and Astro Consulting International LLC. Uh, the man who wrote the book, uh, as I'm reading his uh, official bio, chief editor of the Academic Journal of Astropolitics, professor of astrophysics, you know, par excellence, aerospace engineering, astropolitics. Uh, his experience include work with NASA, Lockheed Martin Space Systems, Colorado State University, University of Colorado. You can name many other institutions. Uh, just uh, you can take a look at the uh, astropolitics.org website. Uh, a prominent uh, scholar, prominent expert on space, space engineering, space politics, uh, strategies, and so on and so forth. Uh, hello. Welcome to uh, Strategy in Future. I'm really happy that we could talk. Yeah, hello. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate being here. Uh, before I start recording, uh, when we, you know, have some sort of a warm-up introductory discussion with uh, with my guest, I, um, I I asked if we could just start by defining what we mean by astropolitics. So, uh, Edgar, if you may say what we define by astropolitics, how would you define it? Right. Well, that's that's a great question. Yeah. Um... I've been involved in, you know, evolving the definition and scope of astropolitics for, for quite a few years now, most of my professional career over the last, um, you know, 20 to 30 years. Um, the field itself, I, I know you've had Dolman on before, the field itself kind of started from folks like Dolman who defined an astropolitik and others who, who really began to look at the area of astropolitics through geopolitics and geopolitical competition and geopolitical security issues. Uh, since that time, I've really broadened the scope of what astropolitics is, particularly through um, research uh, and the academic journal astropolitics that I'm the chief editor of over the past 20 years or so. Uh, and astropolitics today, have, uh, as I've evolved it, really is the human relationship to the space enterprise. So very often we associate the space enterprise with uh, science and engineering, which is the dominant aspects of the space enterprise, but clearly there is the human relationship, the human ecosystem, sort of to speak, related to the space enterprise, which is everything else from the politics to the policies, to the laws and the legal environment, to the economics and the business development and the entrepreneurial activities, to the environmental aspects, to the managerial and organizational dynamics uh, that are really supporting, influencing, impacting the space enterprise and space activities. Uh, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we should understand uh, astropolitics as sort of um, taking a hand on the new domain like it, it used to be sea, sea domain, like a novel domain, air domain, and now the space domain. And there are so many right. aspects involved, all that are meant to serve for the prosperity development of humanity, so to speak, and also warfare. And uh, that, uh, that is all about you know, politics, engineering, warfare, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So a new domain, uh, a new domain. So, you know, for the audience to know, we are recording our conversation on the 4th of March, which is a day after Starship SN10 was launched and landed. Later on, it exploded, but it landed. You know, based on this example, this SN10 launch, how would you, you know, sort of introduce our audience into, into you know, sort of describing where we are in taming the new domain as humanity? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's something we can talk about the entire time, you know, where we are in relationship to the new domain, particularly within the scope of astropolitics. So there's so much involved there, um, you know, from the politics of it, you know, you think about the NASA return to the moon and the Artemis Accords, mm 
that NASA has put forward uh, adhering to international space law and the accepted notion of the peaceful uses of that domain of outer space, as well as to a commitment to the commons kind of notion that's associated with that peaceful use, where we all have free access, uh, free capacity to, to make use of the space environment for, for human benefit. Um, so clearly there's that entire aspect of it, but, but I think given where you've pointed the question, looking at space exploration technology specifically, and their new um, spacecraft development, space launch system, the Starship, which is really being developed ultimately to get humans to Mars, not just to the lunar surface, but to Mars um, as, as kind of the strategic goal of that company. It points to really the capacity, I think, for technology development and where we are in that context, as well as the privatization of space activities. Looking at the intersection between those is something that we would study within astropolitics directly. So it's a really great example in terms of how you phrase the question there. So to one degree, it really speaks to the privatization of space activities. This is an ongoing development that's really been around since the rise of the space age. It's not, it hasn't been fully recognized as such, but it's clearly been accelerated more recently over the last couple decades, largely due to the nature of public private activities, relationships between Let's use the US example since you, you are focused on space exploration technologies as in terms of a public private partnership between NASA as a governmental agency and the private sector, which is much more mature today to actually not just develop hardware on contract to NASA, which has been the predominant model in the past, but to actually operate own those systems and contract out those services then to NASA such as in the area of space transportation, we're seeing that quite clearly today. You know, space exploration technologies, looking at their Falcon 9 Heavy, has, is, you know, not too long ago, put into space astronauts, the International Space Station, on contract to NASA. Now they have a long-term contract with NASA to launch astronauts, operate those missions to the International Space Station. Uh, the Starship represents a further development in that its development really represents an attempt by the private sector to be able to launch systems and launch humans to the surface of Mars ultimately as a strategic goal. Uh, and that represents a whole new maturity that's maturing within the private uh, space sector where that sector is really owning and operating those systems and then providing that as a service to government, as I mentioned. So it kind of shifts the model from what occurred in the past, where NASA contracts the hardware development and then NASA simply owns and operates those systems by itself. So I think it's shifting the paradigm somewhat in that context. Uh, it also points to the state of, I guess, ongoing technology development to an extent. Uh, although those capacities did exist in the 1960s. If you look at the Apollo program, and space transportation systems worldwide. We do have heavy launch systems worldwide. There is capacity, uh, prior capacity to launch humans, you know, very heavy payloads into space to the, to the lunar and Martian surface. Uh, clearly we, we gave up on that capacity somewhat and we're redeveloping that capacity today. I think the major shift though that is occurring is not so much in the technology itself, although there are some innovative approaches such as return and reusability of core boosters, such as you mentioned, you know, they failed with the Starship so far to successfully return the core booster to the ground, but clearly they've done that already with the Falcon 9 core booster. Uh, so that's a new innovation. Um, but the fundamental shift is that the private sector is now mature enough to have that capacity and to own and operate that capacity independent of government. So that represents a new paradigm of how maybe we can move forward with space exploration where the private sector can own and operate certain technologies like space transportation services. And the government can focus on areas where there's less of a market such as cutting edge research and development, uh, doing science on the lunar and Martian surfaces. So it can free the government of that. Although that paradigm is still playing itself out as you know, NASA is still pursuing its own space launch system, 
although we'll have to see if that's really developed to, to full implementation. There's still some doubts on whether that's going to move forward. Yeah, but let me just move to, to, to you know, strategy a little bit so that we define the frame of what we understand right. today by space. Uh, of course, we, we can dis discuss it's a whole universe, which is, you know, unlimited and beyond our imagination. But, I, I, but by space, I, I, I want to ask you what we mean by space now uh, that we embrace uh, by our reach, by our technology, by our strategizing. Is it only really so that is the, uh, the Earth orbit, which is, you know, outer crest of our planet, which is very close, it's, it's, uh, it's within our gravitational pull, which, so it's just part of the planet. Is it up to this, this lunar and the moon, which is in this hill sphere, right? In this uh, dual you know, Earth uh, and moon planetary system, or we, you know, we, it's more. Maybe only, you know, Lagrange points, uh, Earth solar system and Earth moon. How would we define the space? The, where we should strategize. And because strategy is all about structured movement, so what is conceivable for us, us to strategize as humans? And my second question is, do you believe in the peaceful exploration of this new domain or you are more of this you know, great power competition person that uh, no, you know, says, would say that the human nature is flawed and we would you know, fight over that anyway? Right, right. Yeah, let, let me let me start with the first question. Yeah, uh, two great questions there. Um, so, so it's really all of it in a sense, uh, but but in, there's different dynamics to each aspect of it. Um, so the starting point, as as I view it, is essentially where does space begin and where does the Earth atmosphere end? In in a sense, I mean, you can you can try to define that in terms of physics. In understanding the chemistry of the atmosphere. Uh, traditionally, we have defined that at a point of where air breathing engines can no longer operate. It's, it's historically been called the von Karman line, and it occurs at around 100 kilometers uh, above the surface of the earth at sea level, at 100 kilometers. Um, that's generally thought of as the functional domain of where the space domain begins and where the earth domain the earth atmosphere domain ends. And that's important for politics and law and commercial activities because we govern the atmosphere in one way and that doesn't necessarily extend to how we may or may not govern at the outer space domain. So it has, that distinction is important. Now that distinction has largely been thought of in terms of the physics and chemistry of uh, air breathing engines and the functionality of that and where that ends so space kind of begins. That has not, however, been defined as much politically or legally. There is no legal demarcation per se, although I know there are two states in the world, Australia, there might be only Australia, though I think there's one other, it can't come to mind, but I know Australia has legally defined space at beginning at a hundred kilometer demarcation. Other states have not. However, functionally, it plays out that way. Uh, so that gets us into the Earth orbital arena, which is one form of governance, uh, particularly how do we govern the Earth orbital environment? Uh, low Earth orbit is not governed in any specific way, politically or legally. It's thought of in terms of the context of the peaceful uses of outer space. All states, it's, you know, most, the majority of states have ratified the Outer Space Treaty regime and the Outer Space Treaty, the founding treaty of that regime uh, that was established in 1967, which commits states to the peaceful uses of outer space, no harmful interference, and really sets up, doesn't specify it. It calls space the common province of humankind. It doesn't specifically call space a commons per se. It doesn't especially designate space as a common heritage of mankind but it definitely strongly implies that. I'm of the personal view that that's where we should go. We should establish space as a common heritage of mankind. Uh, that was proposed in the, in the um, moon agreement for the surface for, the, for moon and celestial bodies, but that have, doesn't have much adherence in law or politics due to the fact that so few states and no space powers have ratified uh, the moon agreement itself. 
Um, but it does set up a situation of, of how humans successfully govern the orbital environment of space, uh, premised on peaceful uses and no harmful interference. That sets up a regime where we have allowed for military uses of space in a passive sense. We haven't gone down the path of active, ongoing military uh, systems in pace that would constitute being weapons in space, although we've clearly tested uh, the weaponization and, and weapons of space. And some would argue that we are going down a path of weaponization. Uh, but passive uses of space for military purposes has been allowed, including support of war fighting on the ground. Uh, that falls within what's allowed within the regime. Uh, for low Earth orbit, we have no, outside of the non-harmful interference, we kind of govern that through, I guess, ad hoc systems of space traffic management. Uh, there is no active space traffic management systems, though people talk about creating one akin to air traffic management systems for the Earth's atmosphere and commercial airlines. We don't have any active space traffic management legal system or political system. But having said that, we do track space objects, functional satellites, as well as dead satellites, as well as orbital debris to manage that system. And there are governmental systems that's shared by the military that has some of the most advanced systems on a need to know basis. And there are emerging and active uh, commercial um, information that's being shared to get at space traffic management. For geosynchronous orbit, uh, we have a more direct system of management, the International Telecommunications Union. Geosynchronous is primarily used commercially for um, telecommunication services. And that is managed to the uh, constitution of the International Telecommunications Union, where we have an assignment of orbital slots and spectrum two countries would then manage that within their countries as to how they're gonna allocate that to private and governmental entities to be able to operate there with orbital designations and spectrum designations. So there is some management there. Uh, beyond that, we get to less and less management, but a lot of discussion. Uh, clearly there are there's strategic security importance to cis lunar space scientific importance to cislunar space and the Lagrange points, um, how that is managed right now, there is no you know, formalized system of management of that outside of adherence to the Outer Space Treaty of looking at space as the common province of mankind and considering the peaceful uses. Extending beyond there, you know, we do have again, the, the further extension of space law to, to the lunar surface and to the moon itself and to other celestial bodies, whether it be asteroids or the Martian surface. And there's interesting developments in that domain from thinking about things like the Artemis Accords, which largely adheres to the Outer Space Treaty as we get back to the moon um, internationally with the United States and NASA in the lead uh, with a permanent uh, human presence on the moon to thinking about human exploration of Mars. There are issues and, and guidelines governing contamination of planetary bodies. That's about harmful interference of the environment. Um, it, that's been advanced by the Committee on Space Research, COSPAR, uh, planetary protection guidelines to avoid the contamination, let's say of the surface of Mars because we are searching for signs of biosignatures of life and possible life in the past or current forms of life that may be Mars today. Um, so a lot, a lot of different issues at play, um, just to kind of raise a few, but, but there is active discussion in all the means from the orbital environment, from low earth orbit to geosynchronous orbit to cis-lunar space to interplanetary space itself. Yeah, uh, how would you, uh, how would you, in, in that vein, how would you uh, predict uh, the, 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 the emerging moon race to play out in terms of, uh, you know, a peaceful human uh, exploration or the rather the, uh, the um, Artemis Accords when the, you know, 
plots will be divided by members of the agreement uh, uh, facing a rivalry from uh, China, allied potentially with Russia, trying to, right. to build a lunar lunar post on the you know the dark side, on the visible side of the moon. You know, it, it, it given the strategic position the moon has in this dual planetary system on the top of the gravity well that you could, you know, manufacture, use the minerals and build the, you know, planetary infrastructure based on this minerals, which is much more efficient than taking it from Earth. And uh, the military position uh, that you occupy having the moon. And also the words of, uh, you know, the, uh, the President Trump uh, when he was establishing Space Force to protect probably this new marketplace, the supply, the celestial lines of communication to the Artemis program. <laughs> Uh, how would you predict this game to play out? Well, that's that's a good question. Um, I guess there's prediction versus what we would all like to see, right? What what I personally would like to see, what, and and you know, there's others that share my view. Obviously, and there's there's others that wouldn't necessarily share my view because they think it's not a likely scenario. I, you know, you know, there is the argument put forward by by some that, you know. We have the weaponization of space already. There is obviously geopolitical competition. There are space races um, for control of cislunar space and materials from the lunar surface and, ast and, and access to asteroids and the mineral wealth that space can offer. You know, but despite all the competition, despite the security dimensions, despite the way in which we conflict here on earth, despite the facts that yes, space is contested, it's congested, there are problems that we need to address. What I am finding is the most likely prediction is this ongoing adherence to the principles established by the Outer Space Treaty regime and the Outer Space Treaty itself of 1967, most principally. I'm of the mindset, and there are others that share this view, that that's the Magna Carta of outer space. And despite everything else going on, despite all the predictions, and despite the issues we need to address and the propensity for humans to conflict on Earth and the extension of that to outer space, I'm still seeing, you know, almost 60 years later, we're still adhering to the outer space treaty regime and its founding principles, more or less. That to me indicates that we need to begin to develop a commons approach to how we want to govern outer space. And there are analogs that are drawn, you know, uh, the atmospheres are commons and we have models of how we do that on earth. The high seas are our commons and there's a law of the seas. Antarctic but still, is a common, if, we, have, but, we have a treaty of Antarctic. So I think there are many, many models and I'm of the school of thought of those that are looking at how can we successfully govern the commons of outer space for the benefit of all of humanity. And that involves many, many issues that need to be addressed that haven't been addressed by the Outer Space Treaty, which is just the founding principle, such as how do we advance an equitable property rights system in outer space? That needs to be addressed. How do we deconflict? How do we avoid harmful interference? How do we address all these issues? And there are interesting models, you know. One that comes to my mind that I've looked at, for example, is if you look at the law of the seas, there's the International Deep Seabed Authority that really establishes the deep seabed within the law of the seas, the deep seabed beyond your territorial waters and your exclusive economic zones are the common property in a way of the world. And that mineral wealth in the deep seabed needs to be equitably shared. And so you have an international authority that equitably tries to share that resource where everyone can benefit in an equitable way, still allowing for some degree of property rights and commercial extraction of those sources at the same time. So I'm of the school of thought that this is the most viable model for the mineral wealth and use of outer space. Um, and I'm of the school of thought that this is the way I think it will play out uh, although clearly there are other views and other predictions that, that can happen as well. But I think we need to do our best to advance this. And I'm seeing this trend again because of the ongoing adherence and commitment time and time again 
to the founding principles of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. But uh, Edgar, if I may, uh, if you allow me, permit me to to play the uh, the, okay. uh, the, the, the the devil's advocate, okay, for a while. Of course, of course. You know the the high seas, uh, the world ocean of the Earth, uh, is not free. It's just an illusion. It's free in peacetime if the hegemon of the world sea permits for that, and the U.S. Navy right, right. is a guardian of the high seas. The, you know, on planet Earth. Uh, but in war, the sea, the strategic flows across the seas are contested. So uh, if we take this example to outer space, uh, then we need to understand. And of course, for example, um, the US Navy doesn't follow all the high seas rules like UNCLOS. The United States didn't sign it, right? I, I'm right, being right. in Eurasia, so I can see it from the perspective of the land men, right? Which is a different perspective from the people of the sea, like in the US or in Great Britain. Uh, and uh, so the United States wants to, to keep the maneuverability, political maneuverability to project power by US Navy close to uh, Eurasian uh, littorals. And I am, I'm afraid, I'm pessimistic because in the space it might be the same. The space infrastructure has been, as you said uh, rightly, been so important for the global power projection in terrestrial domain. Uh, and there was usually, and there the new marketplace has been developed there, you know, information uh, relays, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Starlink, you name it, right? Telecommunication, downlink, uplink, uh, information became a commodity and someone has to set the rules and enforce the rules of good behavior. Um, and uh, given the, you know, the, the conflicting interests of China, Russia, United States, how could that be? And not to mention the moon. This is why I asked you kindly for your prediction, for your prediction, because uh, in, in Cold War, if uh, you permit me to, to sort of uh, give my perspective, there was simply an equilibrium and space was only the, the, the inter... The, the, the space where the intercontinental ballistic missiles were being, you know, exchanged, but still both parties try, try to maintain the equilibrium and not to put weapons in space to, to sort of bro break it. Now it's more, you know, escalatory, more unstable, you know. Uh, how would you respond to those provo provocative questions? And they were provocative on purpose to keep, you know, to make our conversation, <laughs> you know, like uh, hot, uh, hot stuff, so to speak. Right, right, right. No, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, the challenge there and the questions. Um, you know, you know as, as, as I mentioned, it's, you know, I, I think the trend overall, if, if we begin to look at it again, I'll go back to how I, I finished and I'll, I'll get to, to your challenge there. There is an ongoing commitment to the international law of space, right, to the Outer Space Treaty regime. Now, to an extent, you could make the argument, I've studied international law, you could make an argument that all of international law is somewhat illusionary because it only operates on the basis, generally only during peacetime, you are completely correct, it's suspended during times of conflict and war, and it operates under the caveat that if the powers of the world do not support it, it does, it can't, it can't be manifested, right? So it relies on the hegemons of the world on the powers of the world to enforce and support the principles of international law as established. So, so everything you're saying is correct. I mean, but that is true of all of international law. It's not unique to space. It's true of international law, regardless of the domain. That's how it operates. Um, it's not, it's not, one-on-one -on -one with national laws, right? It, it takes, it's, it's secondary to the national laws of states and the national interests of states, generally speaking. Having said that, I think there's a international mindset that clearly has developed since the end of World War II, where we're seeing a, a sustained commitment by powers of the world to different degrees, of course, to international law itself, to a commitment to international law itself whether in space or in other domains. I think we're seeing that commitment. 
Uh, and I think that's true of the Outer Space Treaty regime itself. We're seeing that ongoing commitment uh, to that. Um, now that doesn't necessarily imply that we don't have issues or conflicts, or if we go down a path of active weaponization of space or wars in space that, that people put out as predictions here. Um, but I think space is a unique domain. It's very, very different than all the other domains on earth. It's different than, we're out of the gravity well, right? We're, we're at the edges of the gravity well, right? We're circling around the gravity well, we're, we're in orbit literally falling around the gravity well, or we're outside of the gravity well, if we, if we start going into cislunar space and onto Mars. So the physics are different. The functionality is different. So what I am seeing, if you really begin to break it down, even independent of a political commitment that needs to be rooted in the self-interest of world powers to adhere to, let's say, the principles of, outer, of the Outer Space Treaty regime of the peaceful uses, a commons notion, maybe evolving that to a common heritage of mankind ideas, was proposed in a moon agreement, coming up with a equitable property rights distribution. But we do have some of that through the ITU with at least uh, the geo, you know, geosynchronous orbit, as I mentioned earlier. But outside of a political self-interest to do that, I think there are, because of the physics of space, there's a very strong argument to make that we can't operate there or function there in any way unless we do this, unless we agree to non-harmful interference, unless we agree to deconflict, because then we can't operate. We can't get the value added benefits economically, security-wise, politically, unless we function in such a way to allow for the sustainable uses of the space environment. And the sustainable use of the space environment, which drives all these other interests, whether we're talking even geopolitical competition and war fighting on the ground, we can't function if we're weaponizing space and harming the space environment. So I think there's a strong functional argument. Uh, I've worked a lot with the military. I've been involved with the US Air Force Space Command I, I, wasn't, I was uh, involved with the US Space Air Force. I worked for the US Air Force Academy itself and for the, government, you know, for the government, really for DOD in that context. And I can tell you that most of the leadership of what is now the US Space Force, because that came from the Air Force, they are of the mindset that it's our interest to have space really be a sanctuary and really be a commons because it allows us the freedom of action. Yeah, yeah, I know. Benefits. But it will be contested, it will be denied by the adversary. That's a, that's a but, problem. But, but the point is that it's, it's not in the interest of the world powers to contest. Maybe to compete, but not to contest. Mm -hmm. I think the, the wild card are the rogue actors. So rogue nations, rogue actors, uh, you know, terrorist organizations or other organizations that want to disrupt the politics of the world to their specific interests or ideologies, however you want to define them. I think my, 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 and what's on my radar screen, and I think on the radar screen of a lot are more rogue actors. I don't think, although we're in a geopolitical competition with China, that's for prestige. And that translates to foreign policy issues and alliances and, the influence we can have on our ground with other countries that has that prestige factor has a lot of implications, but I don't think China is likely to actively contest on any large scale way our space assets. It's not in their interest to do so. They may test those systems to prove a capability, which they have done. You know, they have interfered with our assets through laser and clearly they demonstrated, um, on their own satellite, uh, they demonstrated a, a, a space weapons capability, an anti-satellite capability, but that's for prestige purposes. Uh, most of the folks I talk to and associate with, and my understanding being a researcher in this area and knowing the leadership and having discussions with them, um, do not see that as a very likely scenario. It's not in China's interest. Now a rogue actor is a whole different discussion. So I think what you're talking about in terms of the space being contested, 
That's more a rogue actor concern. Now that can be suspended in a time of war, right? If we, if we were involved in a military conflict with China, there is the potentiality of that being suspended. However, we have to keep in mind that there's a growing reliance on a use of space in the security domain, to take that as an example. And it wouldn't be in a world's power interest any longer, as I see it, to disrupt the space environment in any way and to contest space assets of other countries because that country now has become more reliant on the use of space assets themselves. Given the physics of outer space, it's completely counterintuitive from an engineering and physics standpoint. It makes no sense because I can't function on the basis of a sustainable use of the Earth orbital environment if I'm disrupting that environment. Mm -hmm. You know, just let, let, let's move aside from the war fighting uh, for a while and let's focus on the new economy. What, uh, right. what do you think will be the main breakthroughs in uh, creating the new marketplace, new economy, a transportation system, which will be cheap like, like Starship, or the sort of a new commodities, minerals, new technologies that like solar energy being beamed down to earth that will revolution. What is your uh, gut feeling? And the second question, what do you think uh, is um, uh, when the space economy will really grow uh, to the extent that it weighs heavily on terrestrial uh, you know, so I'm economies and per perceptions. Okay, well, well, let me start with the, the first part and the last part, and then I can get to the, the other aspects of the, the specifics of the economy from, you mentioned transportation, mineral wealth extraction from space, um, whether that's asteroidal, I guess we can include the moon in that to some degree in different ways. Um, and, and looking at the energy offered by space, such as, such as solar energy is an example. You brought up solar energy, uh, what are called solar power satellites or solar powered systems in space. Um, first of all, I think we have to recognize the space economy is already very, very mature. It goes back to the, your first question when you brought in SpaceX, it's a very mature sector. We have, we have not only a commercial sector that can provide support to governmental activities, but we have a mature privatization of space activities, uh, particularly in a domain of, it started with telecommunication systems that emerged out of public-private partnerships from the 1960s and the privatization of telecommunication systems in the 1990s to transportation systems today, as we're seeing most visibly with the space exploration uh, technologies example that you brought up, SpaceX, as well as, you know, an interesting market is the space tourism, largely in the lead there right now is Virgin Galactic um, as another interesting sector. There are some different dynamics associated with it. It's still a suborbital domain as of now. Um, the space economy itself is a very mature, robust economy. It's very, very important to the industrial bases of major world powers. And when I, when I say major world powers in the aerospace domain, that's the United States, Canada to an extent, Europe, uh, individual European states, primarily France, Germany, Italy, the UK, but clearly the European Union is start, starting to play a role in that with Galileo and ESA, of course, the European Space Agency and the ongoing commercial activities and the partnerships that exist in that domain, Japan and India, and China, so those are those, and, and Israel to an extent, I would put those in the categories of where you're seeing these dynamics going on. They play out in different ways because different political cultures, different approaches of public-private partnerships, different even definitions on what's privatization, what's not privatization, what's commercial, what's not commercial, but that's a different line of thought to go into. But it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's ongoing globally to major aerospace countries worldwide. Um, and we have a very mature and robust space economy that's very closely linked to the industrial bases of all these countries and regions I've mentioned. Um, today, the, world, the, the uh, space economy itself is calculated to be around $300 billion. It's not a multi-trillion dollar industry as of yet. Um, 
but clearly the trajectory would suggest that in the future it will become one. It's becoming more and more important to many economic and commercial activities here on planet Earth. And clearly it has a broader impact than the space economy itself. If you begin to consider things like telecommunications and GPS alone, that's important to trillions of dollars of economy and gross domestic products worldwide that can't even be calculated because of how much it's interwoven into the modern economies, the modern dynamics of globalization worldwide. Um, in the specific areas you're talking about, where you're looking at space transportation systems, I think that's a very interesting development. We have the privatization of that right now. Um, clearly that's been ongoing, but I think you've shifted from a public private relationship where the government may own to some degree, either outright own the systems, have ownership over intellectual property, will run the operations part, all that's being shifted now to the private sector, where the private sector not only builds and develops the systems, but they own the intellectual property and they operate these systems independent of government. And then they have a service that they can provide to government now on the space transportation end, which is a really interesting development, largely in many ways over the last 10, 15 years, pioneered and developed by the success of um, space exploration technologies and their launch systems. So that presents an interesting new development, a new marketplace. Um, the market dynamics are not mature enough there as of yet. You know, one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about the space economy and what sometimes we, we term the new space economy or the space economy point you know, two is that outside of telecommunication services, everything else I'm talking about cannot self-support through market dynamics independent of government. The government still, with the exception of telecommunications, the government must subsidize, must be a key customer and anchor tenant sort of speaking in the language of economics to allow for the further economic market development of everything we're talking about from space transportation to the mineral wealth of space. So those markets are still largely rely on government intervention through capitalization or government ownership models in other countries to allow for the development of those systems and then government anchor tenant, government contractual activities to allow for any viability of profit making for the private sector. And the same is gonna be true when we're talking about the mineral wealth of space, whether in the energy end for solar power, which I think is very, very promising and the role that space can play in addressing global environmental issues, sustainable development goals uh, energy is one of those, and there's been a lot of discussion and talk about developing solar power satellite systems on a large scale to address those energy needs, although we haven't really done it as of yet, and how that would play out would be very, very interesting, and what are the public-private dynamics, and what are the economics of doing that, and then the mineral wealth aspect. Um, there are some tentative moves in that domain. Uh, the U.S. passed a law recently allowing for private companies to lay claims to the mineral wealth of asteroids, establishing maybe a model for how private property rights could emerge. There has been a really interesting interpretation in regard to mineral wealth when we're talking about asteroids or the moon where, and this came out of the moon agreement, uh, a lot of not of people are aware of this, but the moon agreement did discuss that the mineral wealth of space should be the common heritage of, of mankind. However, there was an interesting loophole therein that in general, everything's the common province of humanity. It's common ownership in a way. However, the loophole is that once you get to a body, whether it's an asteroid or to the moon, and you begin to extract resources, you engage in in-situ resource utilization, those resources can then be claimed by the operating entity, which is sanctioned by the government. So either it's the government doing it and the government lays claims or the government's licensing its private entities 
to lay claims to that. And that's actually how the U.S. law works. It's, it's a further development of that interesting interpretation that already was part of an agreed to moon agreement uh, where the U.S. and world powers were very involved in at least getting to the agreement, although I guess it hasn't been ratified. It doesn't have any legal authority in that regard. But I think it's really, really interesting. So that, that kind of addresses in part some of the astropolitical issues within the mineral wealth domain specific to asteroids or, or lunar surface uh, resource utilization. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Of course, uh, I fully agree with this uh, government factor, state factor, without uh, which nothing is possible, actually. And people uh, over the last 30 years of globalization, which was a, a really uh, spree for private wealth accumulation, forgot about it. Uh, but the Cold War was won by the, the American state and uh, the innovation was also funded and organized by uh, government. Right. And uh, nothing, uh, it was no different with Columbus and Vasco da Gama and uh, the brave sailors of the Atlantic Ocean 500 years ago. It was still the school of navigators funded by the, the prince, uh, Henry, who, you know, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, that the world ocean revolution from 500 years ago when we subjected ourselves to ourselves the world ocean was also orchestrated, sponsored, funded, and organized by organized state, uh, states of Europe, of uh, the West, of Rimlands of Europe, of the seaboard nations of the Western European Peninsula. And the same will be with, uh, with space. So uh, that's a very interesting point. Uh, you know, the time is, of course, uh, without mercy, and we are navigating uh, slowly but steadily towards the end. And of course, I wanted to ask you like one billion questions. Uh, yeah, so maybe the, the last question, which will be, you know, going really forward in, far into the future. When do you think will be the first settlement on Mars now? That's a difficult question to answer. You know, I, I, I teach students, um, I teach physics and some astrophysics and, and even teach some, some courses in politics. Um, you know, if you ask that question back in the 1960s or in the Apollo program, everybody thought in the 1970s or 1980s at the latest. You know, Apollo was a, was a permanent lunar presence in the making. Um, that ended as a result of the politics. Uh, you know, the, that initiative was, was about geopolitical competition in the Cold War. And once the mission was accomplished, it made no political sense. Um, asking the question today is a really interesting one. Uh, we do have the Artemis, you know, the Artemis program and a return back to the lunar surface with international participation with the United States in the lead. Uh, I see us returning to the lunar surface this decade. I think given where the funding uh, trajectories, the contracts that have been issued, the growing interest internationally and among the private sector companies in the U.S. to make this happen is strong enough to see this program through, though it's gonna rely on ongoing allocations to NASA's budget, right? Uh, presidential support and support from Congress. And that's somewhat unpredictable when we're talking about a return of humans, as we've seen over the past 50 years, a return of humans to the, to the, to the lunar surface. Um, Mars is, is further afield. I think the interesting wild card here that hasn't happened before is what we've, what we've talked about based on the questions you've asked, which is the privatization of space activities on the space transportation end and the Starship program. Uh, space has, has a vac they're developing hardware right now to get humans to the surface of Mars. How will that play out? Um, will there be ongoing funding needed from SpaceX to accomplish that? Will NASA partner in an active way with SpaceX to get humans to Mars. Um, there's a lot of unknown questions there. I would predict, given the trends we're seeing, given the interest of the company itself and, and its founding figure, Elon Musk, given the long-term interest of the aerospace community and the space community of NASA to get humans to Mars, uh, 
given the tremendous amount of resources and efforts in all the Mars missions. Uh, we just had three Mars missions get the Mars successfully, one from China, one from the United Arab Emirates and NASA's Perseverance landing um, a few weeks ago. Given all that, I think there's enough momentum and interest to allow us to reliably think of us getting to Mars in a decade of the 2030s, next decade. But the big wild card is still the funding, the commitment. Uh, but I think this privatization push may be the difference today that didn't exist back in the 80s or 90s or all the previous decades where we always thought of this, but it never, it never happened. And, so, and given the maturity of the Artemis program as well, and that being you know, the lunar gateway being a gateway, not just to the lunar surface, but to considering getting us to Mars as well. I think we have some interesting dynamics that have dramatically shifted for me to have more confidence in a 10 to 15 year projection of having humans on the surface of Mars. And the last really quite last question, and I know we, we need to end, the, shall we have soon the nuclear fusion which is manageable and scalable and doable and operational? Um, well, the, the joke in that community is every 10 years, we're about 10 years away. Um, there are a lot of interesting developments in nuclear fusion going on right now. I know there's been some breakthroughs. I think it was a very recent breakthrough I can't remember the specifics of it on solving some of the engineering problems. Um, the main engineering problem is containing the tremendous amount of heat needed. Uh, you're talking about 15 million degrees, uh, Kelvin or Celsius. At, at that temperature, it really doesn't matter what scale you use. Um, it's a tremendous engineering challenge. I think eventually we will get there. It's really hard to predict in the physics community. Again, the joke is every 10 years or 10 years away, Having said that, deuterium-3, which is the isotope uh, that we use in our nuclear fusion processes, is very abundant on the lunar surface, not so much on Earth. So there are strong advocates for in-situ resource utilization and making use of that helium-3 on the lunar surface for nuclear fusion reactors whether we do that on the surface itself or we mine it and ship it back to earth, many concepts have been suggested in how to do that. Uh, Harrison Schmidt, interestingly enough, Apollo 17 astronaut on the last um, previous lunar mission to the lunar surface. I mean, Artemis is gonna bring about some new lunar missions if we see that through, but he was the last, the last human being on the lunar surface and the only scientist ever on the lunar surface. He's being a strong advocate of this. Um, so those of you who are interested can look at some of his work. He's been uh, talking about this and discussing this for the past 30 or 40 years, uh, looking at how we can make use of um, the helium-3 deuterium on the lunar surface for nuclear fusion um, processes, nuclear fusion energy. So there is that interesting connection to the mineral wealth in that domain as well for, for energy purposes. Yeah. Okay, we need to end this conversation now uh, before we really forget about time and right, dive right. into into you know the the subjects. And so many questions still are left. Uh, uh, who knows? Maybe I'll you know I'll I'll maybe you you know you will agree to be invited again. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Really interesting. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much. much. You can talk. For hours and hours in this, I, I have a professional development course in this area that I offer where I spend 16 hours talking about issues like this. So, and that, that doesn't even cover everything. You know, we've spent one hour, but clearly you can write, you know, people have written books in just in one aspect of this, right? Like <laughs> books sure. just on one, one, just on the law or just on the privatization or just on the geopolitics. So there's, there's definitely much, much to discuss here, but I, I appreciate the questions and it's been very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eligar. My guest today was Eligar Sadek. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, stay with us uh, at Strategy in Future. More talks about space, more talks about astropolitics, more talks about strategies and geopolitics of Terra, of our dear Earth. 
Thank you, Arigar. Thank you.